Hey everybody! So sorry about that technical difficulties. Um, I am live now and I'm getting uh, some emails saying people weren't able to connect. I wasn't either for whatever reason. I was just stuck on going live for a, um, for a little while there. So I apologize. Um, it's just the, the life we live now where everything uh, resides on technological stuff. So um, if you are tuned in live, I'd love to know where you are calling from. Um, and um, so we're not calling from, tuned in from, sorry, now I've got tech problems stuck in my brain, but tell me in the chat room um, where you are uh, tuned in from, I'd love to know, and if you are drinking these wines, um, go ahead and tell me if you've got those wines, or if you're drinking something else and just tuning in for the education, let me know that as well. Should have the chat room up and running. If you can't see the chat room or um, can't, can't figure out how to get onto the chat, make sure you're signed in. So if this is your first live YouTube class with me, um, just make sure that you are uh, signed in there. Oh my gosh, Adrian from Richmond. Hi, it's been forever. I'm so glad you're tuned in. Um, how are you these days? I'm gonna be up in Richmond tomorrow, actually visiting my brother. So um, tell us what you're drinking, Adrian. So good to see you. Um, and I thought about you while watching the, um, um, the um, oh my gosh, the chess, well, oh my gosh, what is the, the the girl on Netflix who does chess that's this, um, this, oh, I can't remember anything these days. This should be interesting. But anyways, I thought you'd, you'd appreciate that, knowing how much you love chess. So Aiden Allen from Norfolk, great to see you. Uh, let's see. Um, Queen's Gambit, thank you. Oh, my gosh, I'm an idiot. Yes, of course. I, I binge watched that all in one day, and now I can't remember the name. So um, all right. So I know quite a few people aren't tuning in live for this class. We'll be watching the recording later. Um, and so if you are tuned in live, um, oh man, Ryan, I was hoping um, that you weren't going to tune in live and then you wouldn't have to, I wouldn't get all these questions that I know you're going to ask me about these wines that I won't have the answers for. So Ryan, who's Croatian, knows a lot about wines from this region. I do not. Um, I, this is definitely not my area of specialty, um, but I am excited that you're tuned in. Uh, that was, that was, that was, oh, I definitely am excited everyone's tuned in. I'm a little bit nervous for this class just because this is the region um, in general that I know nothing about. Um, I'm, I'm pretty well versed on most other wine regions and I could teach classes in my sleep. But I don't know very much at all about wines from the Balkans, uh, especially not Serbia and Croatia. So this is going to be fun. I just tasted these wines and loved them so much that I was like, everyone else needs to taste these wines and, uh, and figure out what is so amazing about this uh, region. So we're going to talk a little bit about the region and the history and these wines, and but it's going to be a lot of just tasting notes on these wines. So if you are not tuning in live and you're watching this at a later date, um, please drop any information in the comments uh, below. If you're tuned in live and you know some of this information that I don't, jump in the chat room and tell me all about it because um, I, I am learning just along uh, everybody else. So it's in the wine world every day that you learn something else about wine. You generally learn how you didn't know anything about wine the day before. And that's just part of the wisdom of, of um, learning anything about whatever craft you are in or whatever trade you're in. So hello, Tawana. Thanks for tuning in. Um, all right. So we're going to start off. Um, I'm going to just chat a little bit about the history of the region and um, these wines specifically. And if you want to go ahead and pour yourself a big old glass of wine number one, um, this is by Stovi is the actual winery. So we're in Macedonia here. And the grape is our Ricazzatelli. Um, so the emphasis is on the cat and the tell. Um, so Ricazzatelli is pretty much how that is pronounced. If I am not pronouncing that as well as I could be, please let me know. Ricazzatelli is how I have figured it out. Um, from Macedonia here. So pour yourself a big old glass of this. This was um, a late add-on for the wines. The other three wines were actually the wines that inspired the class, and then I needed a fourth wine, of course. So I got to taste this, and I fell in love um, with this one as well. So I'm excited to share these wines with you. So hello, Dominica from Williamsburg. Um, good, Ryan, I'm glad that you will be uh, forgiving of my lack of information and knowledge of this region, but 
We're going to have some fun. We're going to taste some really delicious wines, and I can't wait to hear your tasting notes on these wines. So if you, now that I've gotten like the disclaimer part out of the way, if you tuned in to last week's class where we talked about Pinot Noir, and it's not descendants, but it's variations, it's uh, mutations of Pinot Blanc, Pinot Meunier, and Pinot Gris. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the origins of the Vitus vinifera or Vitus vinifera grape genus and species that we know of today that creates like all of the premium wines of the world. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, anything that you think of in terms of premium wine. Um, so basically not Concord or not a Scupperdong or Muscadine kind of thing or table grapes. Those are the genus and species Vitus vinifera or Vitus vinifera. And as far as we can tell, that genus and species of grapevine actually originated in Georgia. So the country of Georgia, which is in this region that we are going to be tasting from the Balkans, um, or as, as is more politically correct now to say Southeast Europe. Um, so as far as we can know, both from historical representation and actual archeological evidence, Grapes were being produced in this region back 3000 BCE. So we're like 5,000 years ago. Um, and not only that, not grapes were not just being produced in this, but actual wine was being made and stored in this area. Um, in these clay pots, so they can actually, they, they because the, the seeds of grapes are so, um, so fibrous and so resilient, yeah. The seeds of the grapes and the grape skins themselves, the residue from the wine that was being made in these big pots, um, stood the test of time and became actual fossilized and then was able to be like, they can actually do scraping of this, break it all down and do genetic testing of it to figure out what it is but, and also figure out through carbon dating how old it is. Um, uh, so um, that is kind of the history of the Vitus vinifera grape, and then throughout different civilizations, you have these grapevines, not seeds being taken from the grapevines and planted everyone else, but actual cuttings of the vine being taken and then grafted onto other rootstock all throughout the rest of the world. Um, and, and so then you have these, these grapes that originated in Georgia being produced now all over the Mediterranean coast, um, thanks to the Phoenicians, and then upwards into the rest of Europe, thanks to the Greeks and Romans, and then continued throughout civilization. So, but it all originated in this area that we're gonna be tasting from. So specifically, this Architzatelli is one of the older grape varieties around. It is, um, it is uh, really fascinating just how old the history is in this region. However, just because they've been making wine um, and premium wine from the Vitus vinifera grape does not mean that they have the most esteemed history in terms of uh, premium winemaking. So based on just history and, and, and different civilizations and how they grew and, and conquered the world and uh, colonized the world, different areas became more important in terms of wine history. And so now it's really just been in the past like 15 years specifically that we've seen a resurgence of premium, premium wine coming from Georgia, Moldova, um, Bulgaria, um, other parts of, um, of the Balkans like uh, Serbia, Macedonia, Croatia. So yes, they've been making wine here for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. 5,000 years of history. However, it's really just in the past 15 years that we've seen a resurgence in terms of the global market and the reputation of the wines coming from these areas. Because it's younger, it's the youngest and oldest wine region out there, um, because it's kind of younger in terms of the last 150 years of premium wine, um, there's not tons of information out there. In fact, I was just seeing what other YouTubers were talking about um, wines from uh, Serbia and Macedonia. And there's so little, like there might be like a one minute video of tasty notes on this one wine and then that's it. Or someone talking about just visiting restaurants in these areas. So there's not a whole lot of information out there and um, about in terms of just the last 
150 years of, of wine making. But we're gonna try some of these uh, some of these wines and have uh, fun figuring out what is going on. So um, Arcazzatelli, or Ricazzatelli, um, I've heard it pronounced both ways, almost like where the R is pronounced like the letter R, Cazzatelli, and then I've heard it just pronounced like R, R, Cazzatelli, where it's almost just like this very small R. So if you know one way or the other, please let me know in the comments. Um, and i um, super curious to uh, to hear uh, other people. Ryan, if you can tell me how to, uh, how to, um, how to pronounce this correctly, I'd be super interested. So this is considered one of the oldest grape varieties um, of the Vicebinifera genus and species. So some historians actually even credit Noah, like yes, Noah of the Bible, for planting or Cazzatelli vines. Those were the first vines planted after the Great Flood. So this is part myth, part legend, maybe part truth. We have no idea. Um, but they actually have, um, because of the, the carbon dating and, and, and genetic testing that we can do now, the clay pots that we have found from um, centuries ago, uh, thousands of years ago, do come back to a very close genetic match to Ricazzatelli. So really interesting how this is one of the oldest varieties out there, but is really only produced in a couple of these countries in this area in the Balkan region. So for Cazzatelli, generally for like the traditional method of making this wine was aging it in clay pots and um, and you're, you're vinifying the wine on its skins for an extended period of time. So you get a lot of that skin contact with the wine. So what we know of as today is orange wine, because white wine is generally not made with lots of skin contact. Usually the grapes come in, the juice is pressed off the grapes immediately, if not just after a couple of hours. But in this, um, the, the traditional style of making Riccatzatelli is definitely this like oxidative, very macerated skin contact kind of wine. So the color was deep amber in color. It was very bitter. It was uh, fuller bodied, tons of the phenolics and bitterness that comes with um, white wine being aged on the skins and the seeds for a long time and, um, and quite different. So now the Modern way of making it is definitely more of this like fresher, greener, crisper style where you're picking the grapes a little bit younger. You're making the wine generally stainless steel aging it, so no oak aging at all, and meant to be consumed a little bit fresher and younger. Um, so um, let's get our noses in this or Cazzatelli and figure out what's in this glass. I love, love, love the smell of this wine. Oh my gosh. This, um, this sealed the deal for me in doing this class for sure, finding this wine. It was like t the taste of spring in a glass. Um, so what's interesting about this grape is because if it allows, if it's allowed to ripen fully, ripen for the full amount of time during the growing season, it's going to develop a high level of natural sugars in the wine, which is great for making very flavorful wine, a little bit fuller bodied, richer mouthfeel, but it maintains its acidity, which is awesome because then it's refreshing instead of cloying and kind of like the wine that weighs you down. Um, so I love the floral notes on this wine. If you've got this in your glass, please get your noses in there and tell me what you are smelling in this wine. I could go on and on and on because I think there's so much jumping out of this glass. It's a very aromatic wine, but I'm curious First, see to see what your thoughts on the wine is. Whew. Oh my gosh, it's just so lovely. Let's see, Ryan says part of the thought and theory is also goes back to Noah's Ark being shipwrecked on Mount Ararat. So um, awesome day, so present day Turkey. Um, so right next to Georgia, fabulous where Raquette Satelli is mainly grown. Yes, so interesting. Um, um, yeah, I, uh, I guess I need to study biblical history a little bit more to figure out um, more about this grapevine history. That is uh, super fascinating to think that um, not only do they think like Noah planted a vine when he grew up, because I mean, that's what I would do. I want to make sure that as soon as I restart all of civilization, that we've got some wine to drink while we do it. Um, but this grape variety specifically is so awesome. What's also interesting to me is that if the whole world did get flooded um, after the waters receded, 
Vines are so resilient. They just are. They just are going to be this, this thing that takes over the whole world one day um, that they would totally survive as soon as the waters receded. They get some sunlight. They're like, all right, ready to, ready to go again. They would not be wiped all out by, by a massive flood. So um, people always ask me about fires and stuff like that in, in California and how that affects the, the, um, the wine industry. A fire could go through a vineyard and um, almost the vineyard acts as like a deterrent to the fire because there isn't a lot of water in the actual, I mean, there is a lot of water in the actual vine. It's not very dry. There's not a lot of things that can burn very easily. So a fire can go through and even if the outside of the vine gets scorched and you lose the, the current grapes that are on there um, through smoke taint and, and blistering and burning and stuff like that, the next year, the vine is, is, is back. So it's, it's really fascinating how resilient grapevines are to almost any condition that the weather can throw out at them. So, all right, what are y'all smelling in this for Cassatelli? Um, and right, Ryan, I've never actually had an amber style of this wine. I have um, only had this crisper, cleaner style, and I've probably only had like three or four in my entire life. So this is um, this is new territory for me too. So let's see. Tawana says getting lots of the floral notes with underripe tang nectarines and hints of green herbaceous notes. Love those calls. Yes. All of the pitted fruit, loads of flowers, and this green, green freshness as well. Um, she says, when I first poured a glass, I was getting some new pool toy smell, but it seems to have faded uh, since being in my glass. Just wait till you get to the next one. Um, all right. So, wow. I'm getting, like, loads of this, like, pineapple core kind of flavor to the wine. Like, you bite too far into the pineapple and you get that bitter crunchy part of the pineapple um let's see how it tastes mm. it's so fresh that mouth-watering acidity it's bright my mouth is just craving chips and guacamole. It's like, I can't stop thinking about that now. Maybe just because I'm craving chips and guacamole, but that's the first thing I thought of when I tasted this one. And now I just continue to uh, want that. Um, the saltiness of it, the creaminess of the avocado, a little bit of spice, um, everything would go amazing with that one. So, um, uh, all right, so. Man, what would y'all pair this with? If, if anyone else is tuning in and is a foodie, what would you pair this with? <sighs> Hi, John, Jeanette, and Kara. Um, let's see, y'all smell the hint of muskiness at first and it faded lots of citrus. Absolutely. I do think that there is some of that musk. I think it's like floral musk, like, um, like the actual flower petals. Flowers have been hanging out in a vase for a little bit too long and they get a little bit like, mushy brown wilted flowers. Um, uh, Tawana says, funny, we're eating uh, steak fajitas with chips and guacamole. Well, tell me how it works with that chips and guacamole. I think I missed some comments up there, but hello, Kira and Rob coming in from California. If, um, what are you, did y'all get any uh, Serbian or Croatian wines for this class or have you got um, maybe another California Cabernet? Tell me what's in your glass tonight. Um, whew. wow. I just am craving spring. I know we had a couple of these like really bright, crisp spring days out there. And that has made this like colder weekend that much more painfully cold, even though it's not that cold. And uh, this wine is like the taste of spring to me. I just, I just want to sit out on a porch and enjoy this without needing a wool sweater or anything like that. So this grape, so if we talk about just the name of the grape, what it comes from is um, the RKA part is the native word for the vine shoot, like the cane of the vine that comes out. Not like this trunk of the vine, but the trunk sends out these canes or shoots, as they're called. Um, and then satelli um, is the local word for red. And so the actual, like not the grapes themselves are red, but the canes themselves are redder color rather than brown or greenish in color. So it's just the, the, the name of the grape variety 
comes from just how the vine looks. So it's a pretty distinct, like if you walk through vineyards, it's pretty distinct. You kind of know when Riccati Italia is, is, is in the vineyards because of that. Um, oh, wow. It's just like so like exploding aromatically. It's really, really interesting. So Ryan says, typically the acidity is perfect um, for Lobio. There are a few varieties, but it is a bean dish. Okay, I can see that with like the earthiness of some beans as well. Hearty bean dish with pomegranate, molasses, and walnut paste. My gosh, that does sound super, super amazing. Um, uh, I know. So... Uh, yes, Ada, um, Tawana is always making these amazing fruits and she always like pretty regularly tends to just have a dish that I'll mention in the class. She's like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm eating right now. So, uh, I think, I think we do maybe next time we need to do a food pairing class where Tawana cooks all the food, we get all the wine delivered and then we, we try the pairings. Uh, so Tawana, tell me if you're down for cooking for everybody. So um tonight y'all drinking a malbec here a fabulous um a bit off this evening mark but you know what it's i mean all grapes kind of originating from this area so you're just drinking like the great 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 grandparent of um that's what we're drinking and you're just drinking the the, the children um far down far down the genetic line so stoby is a winery that is ba basically less than 15 years old and um, started in like the mid 2000s and definitely quintessential modern Serbia. Um, trying to get on the market with fun labeling. So for those of you who don't have the bottle right here, um, very easy to read on the back, says what it is, where it's coming from, how to pronounce it, all of this information that makes it a little bit easier for Americans who don't know anything about Serbian wine. And I really appreciate that about what they're doing. They're definitely, they're modern, they're inventive. And I have to read you on their website. It's so fun. They're, um, see here, let me grab it real quick. Of course it changed. Um, they're, I don't know if it's just a translation or they really are just this passionate and poetic about their wines. I know I do some crazy wine reviews and stuff like that. So I really appreciated the thought that went into some of the writing that they do on their website that I just have to share with you all. Um, oh, da, da, da. All right. I just, this, this first line grabbed me and then I couldn't, um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't pull away. So they say, wine is both the extract and the essence of the grape. Whereas the grape is the essence extracted from the land from which it grows. Like such a powerful way to say the grape is the expression of the vine um, and, and, the, and the land. And the wine is the expression of that grape. So symbiotic relationships So the wine, we're drinking that extraction from the land. It was just a really beautiful way. But if you continue on, like they're very poetic and, and lacy with the way they talk about their story, their passion, their wine. Uh, I know very little about exactly how they make uh, these wines or exactly about um, or about their vineyard management or anything like that, but they're very poetic about the information that they do give. So um, let's see here. Um, so this is from Serbia. And so we are further inland in the Balkans. And so basically the Balkans, um, that whole peninsula named for the Balkan mountains, uh, which back in, of course, typical history, some guy goes to this area, finds these mountain ranges. He was like, these are probably the tallest in the land. So we're going to name the entire region after these mountain ranges, um, but not so. And, um, and, and basically grouped this whole land in together geographically, but he's not from that area and knows nothing about it. So again, typical history of how we, how we just continue to get it wrong. So modern day, we just call it Southeast uh, Europe. The Balkans is, is, I guess, a little bit more known in terms of what people, what people think of in terms of that whole area. But it goes down into Greece and even Turkey um, are sometimes included in this, but definitely up uh, Serbia, Croatia, um, Moldova, Bulgaria, and um, Macedonia. So North Macedonia right above Greece, which is where we are going to jump to for the next wine. So Ryan says, I'm just going to keep uh, referring to you, Ryan, for, th for this class especially. Um, it's the Balkans. We have a way with words over there. Okay, great. Uh, wine is more than a drink. It means a lot to us over there, not just a sentence. It's definitely from the heart. It is amazing. It's true. It's a very beautiful way of 
of, of writing. Um, as they go on, I love this part too. We keep, even though they are very modern winery um, with, with young winemakers and kind of making this more modern style, it's about expressing the land and the history and the ancestry of, of, of how it are all originated, which is why they use these um, indigenous grape varieties. So they say, we keep the covenant of our ancestors. Through the wine, we unite the past and the future, the tradition of the old masters in harmony with the modern knowledge and technology. So to steal a small part of immortality and pack it all in a bottle full of wine, a bottle full of passion for life. Like I, you could pay me a million dollars and I couldn't write a sentence better than that. So really beautiful way of putting it all. Um, if you all are ready, we're gonna jump over. So we're gonna jump back between Serbia, then go to Macedonia for two wines and then go back. I mean, sorry, starting in Macedonia, go to Serbia for two wines, then going back to uh a Macedonia at the very end. So whenever you're ready, we're going to try this wine next. So this is Margus Margi is the name of the actual label. It is by Vina Budimir, and it is 100% Riesling. On the back, they call it 100% Rhine Riesling. That is a synonym for the Riesling we know. Um, unlike Welsh Riesling, which is a different grape than Riesling, um, Rhine Riesling is Riesling. So it's just um, it's just the name of the uh, just a synonym for the same exact grape. So this is from Jupa in uh, southern Serbia, and pour that in a glass. Definitely excited to get our noses in here and hear about um, what y'all are smelling in this wine. Wow. So I actually poured this in my glass um, about 30 minutes ago uh, or 40 minutes ago just to see how it would change because when I first opened this wine up, it was so powerful in this like austere or even severe way that was really beautiful, but it was definitely like unapproachable, if that makes any sense at all. So let's get our noses in here. So if you if you notice the vintage on this, this is a 2012 vintage of Riesling. Generally speaking, Riesling is, um, can age for a very long time because of its very high acidity. However, generally it's released young and the aging is up to you, the consumer. Vina Budimir is the opposite of Stobie in terms of their style of winemaking. They're very, very traditional and they are aging their wines, um, even their white wines, even Riesling, in these huge Serbian oak casks, um, so uh, 3,000 to 4,000 liter casks, so very, very huge casks, older casks, so this is not imparting new oak flavor to the wine, it's just imparting textural components as the wine ages with oak and a little bit of oxygen, um, and they're aging it for three to four years in oak, before it's put into a bottle where it's aged a little bit longer to come together and then they finally release it to the market. So 2012 Vintage is the current release. When I first tasted this, tasted it with a distributor who I know just picked this up from another distributor, Virginia ABC Laws. Every distributor has to buy the rights to carry an individual label from a winery um, of, of each label. So I could make 12 different wines. You as a distributor might only choose to carry three of them. So another distributor can carry the other nine. But once I buy the rights to carry those, no one else can carry that wine in Virginia. It's obnoxious. It's really frustrating. But I know the distributor who used to carry this didn't sell a lot of their stuff. They just have a bigger portfolio, got lost. And so the new distributor picked it up. I was like, oh, they just got a lot of like old inventory. I don't know how good this is going to taste. Nope. Looked it up. This is the current vintage of this wine released in the United States. So 2012. So we were at uh, nine years old on this, which is pretty unheard of to release a white wine, especially Riesling at nine years old as the current vintage. So really interesting winemaking technique. Um, really fascinating aromatically and structurally on this wine. Um, John says, definitely getting the petrol. Oh my word, yes. Tawana says, wow, all the plastic toys coming out of this glass, yes. Um, see, we're getting crayons with some stone fruit hung up on the crayons. Yes, that petrol, that diesel, that crayon, that waxy 
um, pool toy is is outrageously explosive on this wine. I um on my notes on this wine, I um I think my first thing I actually have my notes. Let's go back to it when I first tasted it. And usually I just write down my first impressions of a wine. So I keep these very large notebooks um, that 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 go through very quickly every wine I ever taste so that I, you know, just get better at tasting wine and I'm a nerd and I like to write everything down. So I wrote, if Barbie binged on candied peach rings for a whole weekend and Ken, who she's hanging out with the whole weekend, got a, went on a bender of peach snapple tea, like all of this stone fruit, but then this like candied or like um, almost um, uh, uh, concentrated way, this really intense way. Um, but all of the Barbie plasticky kind of petroly way. Or if you just like poured all that Snapple tea into some brand new tennis shoes and um, and walked around with them. Or if you were pouring Snapple tea through a new garden hose or filled up a pool toy with it. So anything that you can think of to explain that petroly diesely uh, flavor is, is really fat. Um, uh, fitting for this wine, I think. So typically, Riesling can often give that vibe of petrol, diesel, plastic, however you want to say. It's not necessarily the grape itself, but generally speaking, the soils in which Riesling expresses so intensely. So there's something about slate soils. When white wine grapes grow on slates in slate soils, they express this aromatic profile. We don't still really understand the chemical process of why that is. Um, if you tuned into any of my soil series classes, you understand that there is that we don't know so much about what makes wine smell like it does. Um, but there is something chemically that's happening in the soil, in the vine, in the grape itself, and is expressing slate soils in this very petroly way, which we think of like oil is found in slate soil. So it, or um, crude oil, so think of petrol and diesel. Um, plastic is all made from these oils. So it makes sense, but we don't understand how it goes from the grape, from the um, the, the vine roots to the grape itself and into the wine. So it's really interesting, everything we don't know about wine still to this day at 2021. But um, again, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know anything. That's the fun of uh, getting older and wiser. So, um, whew, wow. So now that my wine has been open and in my glass for about 40 minutes, it's definitely like toning down a little bit of that plasticky aromatic and is a little bit more fruit forward on the peach and apricot side and not as concentrated uh, like those candied peach rings and Barbie on a bender with a uh, snapple tea. And it's more like, um, like dried apricots, you know, those uh, dried apricots in Ziploc bags, those preserved apricots, even some dried mango and uh, pink grapefruit pith, like the ruby red grapefruit, but like the membranes, like the more bitter parts of it. So that's just on the nose. Let me see how this wine is opening up on the taste. So Tawana says, very shy on the palate, much lower in acidity than I expected. Part of that is just the age of the wine. Part of that is it's still high in acid, but because of that oak aging. So what oak does to wine, if it's new, it's going to impart a lot of the flavors of oak to the wine, especially if it's a toasted barrel. If it's really old oak, what it's doing is just making the wine in a more oxidative environment. And oxygen, as we know, changes the chemical structure of the wine and the textural components of the wine too. So it's gonna make it softer. Um, oxygen softens the edges of wine. Um, whether that is in a decanter, in a glass swirling around for a long time, a long time in barrel. If you're doing stainless steel, there's no oxygen. It doesn't matter how long it's hanging out in stainless steel, there's no oxygen imparted to the wine. So that's called a reductive environment where no oxygen is purposefully no oxygen is allowed to come into contact with the wine. So very different um, oxidative versus reductive style of winemaking. This is made in an oxidative wine style, which 
I appreciate in this wine because I think if it weren't for that, the acid would be so intense that uh, this wine would be would be hard to consume, difficult to like consume and enjoy. Um, I think the acid is definitely there. I don't think it's as zippy as that Riccatelli was. Um, this is definitely definitely that um, richer, more mature style. So in my tasting notes for this one, I put it was like the opposite of the sexy librarian. So the sexy librarian, it's all this like she looks all put together and like and 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 official and and nerdy and smart and stuff like that, but there's like the sex appeal to her as well, right? This is like the severe libra librarian. So bun so tight, like it looks like, you know, it's pulling her entire scalp back. She never smiles at all, just like a very severe person, but she's stunningly beautiful at the same time. So that's, that's the impression that this wine gave me when I first tasted it. And as I continue to taste it all this last week, um, to get more acquainted with the wine because I just wanted to go back and try it again. I was like, well, has anything changed with this wine? It was so intense. Has it loosened up a little bit? And like slightly, I mean, this this librarian is still on the severe side, um, um, not, uh, not, not on the loose side at all. So quite interesting, the... Um, just the, just the personality of this wine. And even with all that oak aging and, and nine years old, it still is so tightly wound up. So this wine could easily age for another 10 years, like absolutely easily. And it's a food wine for me. I really want it with uh, oysters. I want something, I want something rich. I want something salty. I want something for this wine to like grab hold of. So, um, <laughs> Look here, I've got a lot of um, learning to do from how, um, how these wineries are writing about their wines because reading all of their history notes, like I, like I read, um, read online about their, from their website, uh, it just proves how amazing some wine writers are. Um, to me, I always personify everything. I don't know why I think uh, people are really interesting and um, I like observing people. So it's, it's fun for me to uh, compare wines to people because I think it makes sense. If you go into a wine store and read a tasting note saying um, it smells like plastic and peaches, you might not be really interested in buying that wine, but you, you read a description that personifies it, you almost feel like you got to know that wine a little bit more, and now you want to buy that wine to figure out like what it's all about. So um, I, I don't necessarily do it as a sales tactic that way. I'm just saying that I think it makes wine a little bit more accessible, a little bit more understandable, a little bit um, easier, to, uh, easier to consume. So, all right, so whenever you're ready and we can go back and um and revisit any of these wines as y'all have questions or uh want to revisit the tasting notes on these wines um this class is going faster because i have less information on these wines to give i uh i gotta say i uh i was um i was i was hurting when i was like looking through all my normal resources for these wine regions and the history and the soil types and how it's made and there's just so little out there so i guess i need to visit the area, do some intense research, write the research that I want to read, and so then it's available for everyone else. So field trip to the Balkans. Um, if anyone is interested in going with me, maybe Ryan, you could lead the trip and, um, and tell us where to eat and what to eat and uh, be a translator for us. I think that sounds amazing. So, um, all right. So we are going to try next, same winery. So we're only trying two wineries here. Um, so this is also from Vita Budimir, and this is their Triada, and this is the grape Procupats, or Procupats. Um, the C at the end is pronounced like a T-Z, so Procupats is, um, is how this is pronounced. And this is a 2011 vintage, which is the current vintage. So instead of, uh, you know, barrel aging for two years and then release right away and the wines are a little bit too intense to drink right away. This, they take care of the aging for you. This is the current release 2011 into the market. Um, and yes, Tawana, we do indeed have a long list of field trips planned. Um, I actually did talk to a distributor friend of mine and uh, as soon as things get fully opened and everybody's healthy and we can travel and 
eat together safely again. We have talked about the first trip being to Italy, and um, we've already started kind of putting some things into the works. So if you're interested, just keep it in mind that it will hopefully happen sometime soon. It's not just a pipe dream. Let's uh, pray to the gods of, uh, of grapes and wine regions that it's not just a pipe dream, that it will actually happen pretty soon. So um, Vina Budimir is, uh, is the producer on this wine as well. And uh, uh, let's see. Um, Ada says we're actually smelling number three. Okay, great. So this is the Procupats that we're tasting right now. Um, the Triada by Vina Budimir it smells cherry. Unusual for us to smell. Is that is that is that true? Do you not normally smell cherry in, in your wines? Um, I am curious because usually cherry for me is like one thing that I kind of know like any red wine. I can like assume some cherry notes are going to be in there, but there's just some that are more obviously cherry than others. I definitely agree with you on the cherry. Man, this wine is cherry to the teeth. On the nose, this wine to me was one of those wines that in the wine world, we we go through sight, then smell, then taste, and go always in that order. You don't taste first and then smell and then check out the sight. Always in that order, sight, to smell, to taste. And the first thing when you taste the wine, we always say, like, does the palate confirm the nose? Meaning, does the wine taste the way that it smells? And to me, this wine did not. Um, I love wines like that that are um, that are so surprising. Like you smell a wine and you have certain expectations, um, and then you taste it and you're blown away. You're you're totally surprised. Hopefully in a good way. Um, and this wine to me, on the nose, was just so much earth. Now that it's actually been open for quite some time, and uh, then the fruit is definitely coming out. But when I first opened it up, which is why I told y'all to open this wine up about an hour and a half ago. Um, when I first opened up the wine, it just smelled dusty. And not because my glass was dusty, it smelled like dusty earth, like not wet earth, but like you're going down a dirt road in the summertime, it's hot in here, it's not humid at all. And you're just getting all that dirt from the from the dirt road kind of stirred up and it's in your nose and in your eyes and in your mouth and it's just dry, it's dusty, and it's in this, this earthy component. So that's everything I was getting on the nose. I wasn't getting much else. But then the fruit exploded on the palate. I saw these really lovely blueberry notes that I that I got, which are pretty unusual for me um, to get blueberry in wine. So tell me what y'all are smelling in this wine. So again, they do extended oak aging on wine. So they make a wine in a very oxidative style. And this wine was aged for three years. Um, I think some vintage they aged more. Um, because there's just three to four years. Uh, oak aging, again, large Serbian oak casts. So not American oak, not French oak, not Hungarian or Slovenian. This is local oak, made in a very traditional style, these huge oak casts that they use for years and years and years. So we're not imparting oak flavors or characteristics to the wine. We are just making the wine in an oxidative style to create those textural components that we want. So. John says, we opened and decanted half the bottle, trying it from the bottle first, then the decanter, so far liking it. Is there a big difference when you taste it straight from the bottle or from the decanter? I am curious to know for sure. Um, I see cheese being mentioned. I'm in, yes, these these are definitely cheese wines. Um, and Tawana, yes, you'll, uh, you'll be first on my list to, uh, to, to um, invite to Italy. And Ada says we need more aromatic training, don't we all? I um, I I've never had a, I've never been one of those super smellers, one of those people who can just smell something and immediately identify. I definitely had to work at this, so it's just like learning a new language. You meet those people who can travel anywhere, and within 10, 15 minutes, it seems, they are able to like pick up language and dialect and uh, really, really get into a mode of communication if they even if they didn't know anything about the language beforehand they're just people who are very linguistically adept um, and there are people who no matter what they could study a language for 10 years and still only know like two basic phrases our minds just work different ways we all have different skills and talents but smell learning to name what you're smelling is definitely a skill that you can practice so just like learning a language um, you can learn the language of naming what you're smelling. And certain people are going to be really amazing at it and like take off right away. And certain people are going to like 
very hard to get past beginner level. Um, I'm like right there in the middle. So I'm definitely not one of those super tasters. Um, I'm glad about that. because they're the pickiest eaters in the whole world. And I would never be able to eat because I couldn't eat my own food because I'm not a great cook. But um, in terms of uh, just naming what you're smelling, it's all about practice. So if you've got one of those wine aroma grids, I need to maybe start putting those in the wine class packages. Put that on your fridge refrigerator. And every time you open up a bottle of wine or even just cook something, Look at that and try and name a couple things that you are smelling and the extra practice of that will help you hone in those skills will help you like really develop the skill set so it won't be as hard to smell something and kind of name what you're smelling. So don't worry, it is something you can learn um, and um, it just takes a lot of practice and you have to drink wine a lot, which is a great thing to do. It's fun to practice this. So, all right. So. Oh, man. So we're in Macedonia now. So Macedonia right above Greece. Um, more Mediterranean climate. Serbia is kind of this mix of Mediterranean and continental climate. It does get very hot in Serbia during the days, like in the wine growing regions that we're tasting. Um, we're, we're talking about like over 100 degrees in the summertime during the growing season. Um, but it cools down quite a bit at night. And you have these like really intense winds that come through that keep the air dry so one of the biggest problems to a lot of grapes is rot in the vineyard so if any moisture kind of gets stuck around if it's a very humid area we know all about that in virginia moisture gets stuck around the grapevines and creates um perfect conditions for rot mold mildew anything that's really bad for the grapevine unless you're trying to make dessert wine with noble rot where the rot actually eats away all of the juices of the grapes and further concentrates the sugars, and then you make dessert wine from it, like Sauterne. That's not what we're talking about. Any rot is going to um, just create bad flavors in the wine, so you're going to need to add extra sulfur dioxide in the winemaking process to kind of like kill that mold and mildew and all of those spores to make cleaner wines. And then you just start getting into chemicals needing to alter wine that could be made better if the vineyards were a little bit healthier. So because of these intense winds, you actually have really dry areas because um, the winds are just helping create all that airflow and so that rot isn't happening in the vineyards and, and in the actual bunches as much as it would in other Mediterranean climates. So um, interesting growing dynamics we have. We do have some slate in the soils. Uh, it's very rocky soils, um, a mix of like almost every kind of soil type you can think of. There's clay, there's limestone, there's the slate, and all these rocky pebbles in. So it depends very much on the vineyard. And they are still working right now in Macedonia to really hone in geographic regions for this region is really known for this type of soil. So right now it's kind of these broader pencil strokes of like this is the wine green region. Um, and then you have these smaller regions kind of in and around. So, um, and they're not as specific as we think of like Southern Rhone or the Loire Valley or Burgundy where every little parcel and plot is kind of mapped out. So it's a newer wine region. So we're really starting to see through experimentation, where are the best vineyards and what's happening the best. This is definitely one of the most uh, traditional um, producers. And in fact, out of all the Macedonian wines, I'm sorry, out of all the Serbian wines, um, out of all of the producers, Robert Parker, the really esteemed uh, wine rater out there, wine reviewer out there, has only chosen to ever rate um, this or review this particular winery. And he's always given their Riesling especially high points. Um, so they are definitely like the most esteemed and like globally recognized winery in Serbia um, and hopefully helping to bring attention to some of the other wineries out there. Now, you know me, typically I'm always like supporting the small guys that no one knows about, but even the most well-known Serbian winery is still kind of new to us in the United States. Ryan is taking the charge and promoting more of these wines uh, from these countries and regions. Um, but we need more people like that. We need more people who understand these wines, these regions, food pairings, how to describe them, how to talk about them, and how to sell them to customers. And until we get that, it's going to be hard to find more of these wines in your local wine store because the, the local salesman doesn't know how to talk about it. So then it's just going to sit on the shelf. 
So um, I'm really grateful that Robert Parker did review these, uh, the Vina Budamea Riesling multiple vintages. Um, I think always like above 90 points too, which is considered highly rated. Again, tune into a different lesson about ratings and, and how much to buy in them, into them or not. Um, but this is definitely a very reputable producer. They've been around for over 100 years and four generations of winemaking uh, in, in a very traditional style. So, all right, let, I gotta get my, I gotta taste this wine. I've just been smelling it. Mm. All right, John says, more cherry in the decanted wine. Okay, great, opens up very nicely, but tastes great either way, fabulous. So I would agree with you, the fruits are definitely coming out more and more as the wine has opened up. When I first opened up this wine on, I think, Tuesday when I got it, um, Tuesday night, it just used a quart of it and just poured a, a couple ounces of it. And it, the tannins were just like assertive throughout the mouth and it was so dusty, so rustic, so masculine. And it took a while for those blueberry and pomegranate and I was getting a lot of pomegranate now. Fresh cherry. Wild strawberry, definitely like these wild brambly fruits that taste more like herbaceous and green versus like the, you know, the, the, the stuff grown in farms for like consumers and in grocery stores. So a little bit wild, more brambly style fruits, definitely on the blue and red side and a little bit of floral notes, but they're definitely like dried um, and, and, and older, not like potpourri, but um, definitely like dried flower petals. Uh, on this wine. Tannins have softened quite a bit since I first tasted this wine, but they're they're still there. So I want food with this wine, but I don't want a really, really intense meal because I think it'll it'll overpower the more delicate fruit profiles in this wine. Um, so I think, what would y'all pair this wine with? Um, now that y'all are sipping on this Procupats, um, what would you pair this wine with? It's so fascinating that this wine is 10 years old. It doesn't have any of those caramelization notes. It doesn't have any of that like um, oxidative notes of, of burning sugar in the oven or caramelized onions or um, anything like that at all. Vanilla extract. It, it, it's definitely still fresh and still useful. And at 10 years old, this is really fascinating that this wine has a, is still super vibrant and useful. I think I put on here that I would pair this with French dip sandwiches, and I can kind of see that. I want, like, the the, the sauce, a little bit of the spice, but flavorful and rich, but without being overpowering uh, as a wine at all. <sighs> yeah, Tawana, you are a case in point. You're, like, my um, my, like, gold star student for someone who – you apply yourself regularly. I, I get your tasting notes regularly and from like where you were a year ago or a year and a half ago to like where you are now. Um, it's, it's really amazing. Um, just get into practice. So gold star to you, Tawana, but you're all doing great. Just keep drinking wine. Um, Tawana says, I want it with a basic burger and nothing fancy. I like it with a little bit of char on it. I think it would be fantastic. Do y'all want some wine? You just have to come get it. Okay. Chatting with my uh, video videographers over here that they can also pour themselves some wine. Um, all right, so let's go back to Macedonia. So this area in Macedonia is, all right, Ryan, help me out how to pronounce this. T-I-K-V-E-S. And I don't know how to pronounce that. I couldn't figure that out. So um, I got I got the great Vranitz um, with, again, that C is like a T-Z. So Vranitz is how the grape is pronounced. Veritas is just the wine label. Winery is uh, Stoby, and it's a 2015. So, again, we've got about five and a half, six years on this. So it does have some age on it. What I found so fascinating about this wine when I was reading it in my my book that I love so much, The Grapes by Genesis Robinson and others. Um, they, they talk about this grape as being um, perfect for light-bodied 
red wines and darkly colored rosés um, and often used as a blending grape. So really interesting that uh, it is such a powerful, intense wine for sure. Um, nope, I apologize. Um, this is this is just, uh, y'all get to learn with me as I'm like learning all of this. The Procupats was what was known for very light styled red wines and darkly colored rosés. And um, obviously it wasn't that either. So I was also surprised I just got the, the wine wrong. This might be one of those videos that I delete after um, after a week, after y'all all tuned in live. Um, so, but no, I, I think it's important to stay humble and, and understand um, that no matter how much of an expert you are, there's you're never gonna know everything about every region. So admittedly, this is a new wine region for me. So anyways, Vranets, this grape here, means black stallion uh, locally. And uh, so the grape skins are really dark and pigmented, often added in blends to add color and strength to the wine. Very tannic, full-bodied, high in alcohol content, but lower in acid. And so it creates a wine that is like really modernly appropriate for those people who like those big, bold reds, like extracted, powerful wines from California or Australia, Argentina for um, Malbec drinkers. This is a perfect wine for them, Vranets. So this accounts for about a third of the entire grape grapes grown in this region is the grape Vranets. So definitely the most important red grape variety to the region. It's actually native more to Serbia and uh, was introduced to Macedonia in about like the mid 19th century. I mean, sorry, mid 20th century. So it's only been the last like 50 to 75 years that this grapevine was introduced to Macedonia and now it's grown there prolifically and is the most important um, grape in the region, red grape specifically. Um, super vigorous, which means that the grape vine itself grows a lot. It's very, um, it's very uh, assertive uh, and very uh, much trying to, again, take over the world like invasion of the body snatchers and trying to uh, grow and expand um, their vines. It's also creating a lot of grape clusters too. It's very productive. So it's a great way for people to make a lot of wine pretty cheaply. So it's not like some of these great vines that you've got to cut half of your fruit to make a wine that tastes decent. Um, this grape specifically, because it's vigorous, because it's productive, makes a lot of wine that still tastes amazing without needing a lot of fruit cropping to make it taste powerful or concentrated or complex. So, oh, let's get our noses in there. Tell me what you're smelling. This wine is so much I could... I can almost get a little tipsy smelling this wine alone because it's so powerful on the nose that alcohol is really intense. It says it's only 14%. Let's see, what was the Procubats? Uh 13%, which I would say was pretty close. The Riesling, curious now, 12%, about standard. I'm guessing it's about the same for the Roccatelli. 14% for the Roccatelli, actually. So 14%, wow. Um, 14% on here, I think the alcohol is a little bit hotter than that. Um, I would guess closer to 14.5, 14, 14.7, 14.9%. You're allowed to legally fudge your alcohol numbers by um, quite a bit. Um, and generally speaking, 135 to 14% is like the sweet spot for stable wines, for wines that are not volatile, wines that are not considered unstable for aging. So much over that, and you start getting to like the danger zone of the alcohol changing the way the wine will age. And so a lot of people, if they're quite a bit over, will fudge their numbers down a little bit. Now, because of the European tariffs on wine, which were just lifted, at least it is only temporarily right now, but we should see in the future some prices of our European wines going down a little bit, which would be amazing. Um, because it's been hard to continue to sell some of these wines because the prices have just gone up with that 25% tariff. But that 25% tariff included all wines 14.1% and under. So it's interesting to see that last year, um, people who were at that 14.1, 14.2% who might actually fudge down a little bit to 139 actually started fudging their numbers up a little bit to 14.5%. So that um, they were not um, they were not uh, affected by the uh, the European wine tariffs. So 
Um, let's let's hear what y'all are thinking about this. Vranitz. Joanna says, well, I love the nose on this one. Yes, there's so much going on here. Got loads of baking cocoa powder. Yes, like that chocolate, but that bitter powdery chocolate rather than sweet chocolate at all. Um, makes me think of the aromas of melting down chocolate to make brownies. Okay, I love it. Uh, Ryan says, if you like this grape, I definitely suggest looking into Plavak Mali. No idea if I'm pronouncing that uh, right. Comes as a cross between Tribidag, which is Zinfandello Primitivo, and Dobricic. Uh, man, this is just terrible, my pronunciation of this area. Um, similar profiles, yes. Um, so interestingly enough, the Prokopat is currently thought of as a possibility of one of the ancient, like the grandparents of Tripodrag, which is the Croatian origin of what we know as Zinfandel. It's native to Croatia, Tripodrag, and its grandparent, native to Serbia, is um, Prokopat. So really interesting how basically you can you can trace all the genetic roots of, of most of most vines from all over the world, most grape varieties to this area. And this area as a whole is kind of like fathered or mothered the um, the rest of um, the grape varieties as we know it. So like Riesling is a German grape variety or originated in Germany, but its grandparents were brought to Germany um, by, um, by by seafaring Phoenicians, basically, um, up and down the Rhine River as they were trading. And those vine clippings came from these areas. So Serbia, Croatia, Georgia, this whole area. And and, and then through cross-pollination pollina in the vineyards, and you just have genetic crosses and hybrids that come about uh, genetically throughout the centuries and throughout the years. And it's, and it's just so fascinating that it all started in this one area and we're we're tasting some of the history, some of the roots, no pun intended. Um, John says we got a bit of coffee. Yes, yes, like this mocha, espresso, kind of roasted, richer style of coffee. Love, love, love that call. Um, Georgia has exported the most in 2020. Their exports continue to skyrocket. Absolutely, I think. As um, wine prices all around the world have skyrocketed in the last like 15 years, thanks to millennials that drink a lot of wine, um, and and just in general, wine being a more um, a go-to drink for a lot of people rather than just elitists, just collectors. Um, people are looking to try wines from other areas. Um, also, just social media has really helped bring exposure to wine regions that people hadn't heard of before and hadn't tried before. So it's, it's really fascinating to think about what's going to happen in the next 15 years as marketing changes, as wine drinking palettes and, and tendencies change, as these wine clubs and wine membership and wine education becomes more accessible and more popular, um, how that will all change um, the, the future of these other of these other wine growing countries. So. Um, let's see here. Other tasty notes here. Let's see. Ada says, you need to pair some dark chocolate. I like the, the tasty note and the pairing note of the chocolate. I was thinking about some port lately. This would have taken the place without the heaviness of port. Yeah, without the 22% alcohol and the loads of sugar. It's that raisinated quality of the fruit. Like, um, the, I think my tasty notes were like charred figs and dates, if you like cook them down, um, reduce them down, um, on served with some balsamic reduction, so I get some balsamic in here too. A little bit of this meatiness to it, a little bit of this like charcoal-y wooziness to the wine. This wine won't take no for an answer, this wine is like, very powerful, kind of commands your full attention. Um, I would need to drink this slowly, right? This is not coffee and wine. It's rich, it's intense, it's heavy, it's full body. The tannins are kind of gripping all throughout my cheeks, my gums, my palate. This wine is uh, definitely for like sipping. I would want this, I think this would be amazing with some like baked brie. 
Um, you can go the sweeter style, style and make the wine seem a little bit more savory or on the more savory style and make the wine seem a little bit more sweet. Um, I think either way would be a really interesting uh, pairing with this, but I would also just want it with some figs and dates drizzled with some balsamic kind of served over top of like a char grilled flank steak or something would be really amazing. So um, this is a, wow. All four of these wines, you couldn't get a more drastically wide array of tasting in just four wines, I think, if I had tried um, from the, um, if you've got it in your glass still, go back to the Riccazzatelli and just tell me what you think about this wine. Drink it straight out of the bottle if you've already used your glass and don't want to pour white wine into red wine glass. Um, Yep, still super delicious. I'm getting like just straight up Granny Smith apples or Jolly Ranchers. Now that I'm going back to this wine, all that like green fruitiness and sweetness is coming out. Let me try the Riesling again. I like to do power tastings at the end of a tasting. And straight up like I'm eating oyster shells. All that minerality. All that intensity is kind of just, um, that's what I'm getting. All the fruit, to me, I think is overshadowed by the fruit of the last two wines that I just had. Um, and I'm just getting straight up this pencil shavings, oyster shell, chalky. Like if you've ever weight lifted and used like hand chalk at all, like you get that in your mouth a little bit that um, weightlifting chalk in your mouth kind of flavor. All of that minerality is, is, is what's most apparent in that wine. We go back to the Procopats, grandfather of Zinfandel as we know it today. Straight up like dried cherry pits on a smoldering fire. Um, with some with some blueberry tea. Uh, <laughs> this is such an odd wine going back to that in like a quick quick tasting format after having all the other ones. And finally, let me try the Vranets again. Mm. Oh, it's just powerful. It's just so, so intense. Um, there's no way that wine is 14% alcohol. That like I feel that I feel that burn down to like my clavicle. I, I'm guessing that's like 15% almost minimum. Um, really interesting. So Ryan says, do I get a little bit of quince in that um, nose on the Rocchettelli? Um, I don't on this one. I'm getting everything like more on the green side, like quince if you like eat it fresh. But most people don't eat fresh quince like that because it's too bitter, and too sour. Um, um, it's way more tropical, this, this particular wine for me. So, um, so what else, uh, um, what else are y'all getting on this wine? Like, what else would you consider pairing this with? This could be that really intense burger, but I would want all of the fixings and not like lettuce, tomato, onion. I want melted cheeses and caramelized onions and mushrooms and, um, and sauce on this burger with this Vranets um, or baby back ribs. Like I could totally see that too. Anybody else have um, have any tasting notes or pairing recommendations on any four of these wines? Um, so um, here we go again, we got a, Sorry, y'all. Um, every now and then I get these like weird um, messages pop up on the live live videos of people just basically uh, bombing my chat room. So I apologize about that, but that's taken over now. Um, so um, thank you for reporting him or her, uh, Tawana. I appreciate that. 
John says, made a traditional Serbian dish just to try with these wines. I think the fourth wine will pair well. Please tell us what dish you made. Very fascinated now. Um, I, I All of these are food wines to me. I think out of all of them, the one wine that I, I'd just enjoy sipping without the food would be their Cassatelli. Uh, I just, I've been thinking about that wine all day. I've been so excited to taste that wine again. Out of all of them, that's the one I kept thinking about, honestly, because of its freshness, its vibrancy, and its ability to just like drink by itself. So um, Ryan said, versus lamb is always perfect pairing with any Bach and red. Totally get that too. Definitely, these wines do seem, if I could pair them, or match them in personality or style to another wine region that's a little bit more well-known. They'd be close, close to match these wines to Southern Rome, that mix of Mediterranean and continental climate, those harsh winds, rocky soils. So overall terroir is pretty similar. Um, and a little bit more rustic style of winemaking where oak isn't the most important thing, it's expressing the wine. Um, and so if the wines were aged in oak, it's that older oak that's not imparting tons of flavor, just imparting the oxidative style to the wine. Um, and those like the rustic characteristics of these wines. So I would, and, and, and lamb with any Southern Rhone red is always a great choice. So I would, I would say that, I, that out of any wine region that I can compare these wines to, having tasted for the first time all four of these wines side by side, that, that's my impression. Are there any other impressions that you have of these wines? Do any of these grapes remind you? Any of these newer grapes? Maybe Riesling is the only one you've had before. I don't know. Maybe you collect um, Procopats. Um, I'm not I'm not sure. These are definitely for me. Like, I've never had Riccazzatelli, Procopats, or Vranets more than a couple times each in my entire life. So all of these are a little bit newer uh, to me. So is there anything that these remind you of? Do you get a little deja vu tasting Mercatitelli and think about something else or tasting a Procopax and thinking about something else? Um, I love whenever I taste a new grape, I'm always like, well, if Pinot Noir and Sangiovese got together and made a baby, that's what this wine would remind me of. Um, that, and, and to me, I don't get specific grapes. I, I, I get like a style of regional kind of flair and characteristic of these wines. So um, so Ryan says, uh, definitely more rustic style of wine making, more in your face bold wines. Roasted lamb though, I love it. Um, uh, under Dutch oven, okay, fabulous. Uh, Twana says number three, definitely reminiscent of Pinot Noir. Yeah, those brighter flavors of fruit, those more like red and uh, and blue fruits, a little bit more of those dusty characteristics and a little bit of a lighter body. Um, John says the dish that he was making, moussaka, fabulous, um, as beef, onions, and potatoes. It sounds amazing. Now I'm very, very hungry. Way to go. Thank you. Um, um, uh, which did it pair best with? Did it pair best with the Procopats or the uh, Vranets? I'm uh, curious. I think based on the seasoning, if you did a little bit of a lighter seasoning, then the Procopats I think would be fabulous. If you did like richer, more intense flavors, then I could see the Vranets being a really good pairing um, or both. Um, if you if you do food pairings like I do, and every dish has two wines that goes with it, so um, so next week, just to let you all know, um, as we wrap up here a little bit, um, next week is a Meet the Winemaker class. I'm so so excited! So next week will be hosted on Zoom. The video will be posted on YouTube, but for people who want to be a little bit more interactive uh, next week to meet the winemaker and so that he and I can both be on camera, we're gonna do it on Zoom. Um, if you aren't getting the wines but still wanna tune in, I will give you the link, just let me know. Um, I will uh, email you the link for that Zoom link. So it's not like I only give the link to people who get the wines. Anyone can tune in just like on YouTube. I just need two screens to be able to uh, have me and the winemaker. Um, very excited about this. So this is Lioca Winery in Mendocino. Newer winery, fresh and modern, but like new California. And new California is in like old California, but not the middle California. And let me explain what that means. So like originally California wasn't making these like really extracted, very oaky wines. Um, that really happened in the 80s and went on until about 
I'd say within the last 10 years, we've seen a push away from that, but not an, an incredibly intense push away from that. So from the 80s on, we see this like style of making these very extracted, very bold, very intense California wines with loads of oak and uh, very high alcohol contents and often residual sugars too. Stylistically, that's what Robert Parker was reading highly. So um, that's what people started making because it made sense. Lioko is kind of uh, an homage to old style California and they're making wines with much less extraction, lower in alcohol content, lighter oak aging. They focus only three grapes, Chardonnay, and they make beautiful Chardonnays. If you don't think you like Chardonnay, this could change your mind because Chardonnay is tricky for me to like. And I, I, I don't particularly love the super oaky, buttery styles of Chardonnays. Um, this is definitely more reminiscent of uh, French style Chardonnays. Um, Pinot Noir, he makes some really, really beautiful styles of California Pinot Noir. And then Carignan, so a uh, Rhone variety um, that is often blended, but is sometimes made into a varietal wine, meaning not blended. And he focuses on these really old vine Carignan vineyards. I mean, we're talking like 75 plus year old vines. And so we're going to be trying two different Carignans side by side. So I'm really excited to um, introduce Matt um, Licklider. Lick I think is how you pronounce his last name. Yeah, my pronunciation is just off all night tonight. Um, but that's, uh, so he will be joining in. Uh, him and his wife started this um, Lioko just, yeah. just within the last 10 years. So really fascinating to see what they're doing in California these days in Mendocino with Old Vines Carignan. So very excited if you want to tune into that and you don't have those wines or don't live locally, just shoot me an email or a message or Facebook or Instagram or smoke signal uh, and I'll give you the link so that you can participate uh, with that. Kira, if you're tuning in from California, I would love for you to get their wines and join in uh, with us um, uh, here in Virginia. If you guys have any other thoughts about future classes, so I've got April planned out and I'm starting to plan out, um, I'm sorry, I've got March all planned out, starting to plan out uh, classes for April and May. Um, including some blind tasting classes. I know people have been asking to get back into that and some other Meet the Maker classes. I am very curious to know what you want to taste, what you want to learn about. Um, I taste wines that inspire me and I make classes around them, like tonight's class uh, about wines that I have known nothing about, Serbian and Macedonian wines. Um, but I will also want to know what you are interested in and what you'd like. So if you have any ideas about other classes to do in the future, please let me know. I am all ears and would love to hear your thoughts about what you want to taste. So I hope you all have a lovely rest of the evening and uh, continue drinking and enjoying these wines. Ryan, thank you so much for your help in all of these. I know you didn't even have the wines. Thank you for um, your help in translating and helping uh, get this information out there about Balkan wines, wines from the Balkan region. So I appreciate everything everyone does and um, for supporting vino culture and these education classes and keeping wine nerds, y'all. Until I see you next time, I will um, be drinking some really delicious fracazzatelli. Cheers, y'all. Bye.